Heavenly Father, many people will be reading Sunday newspapers just now and wondering where the world is going to. We thank you that we can come and read your word and know where it's going to. That it is your plan and purpose to sum up all things in Jesus Christ that one day every knee will bow to him. Father, men and women will be reading about the sins and disgraces of men. We thank you that we can come and read about your holiness. And men and women will be reading of things that are sad and sordid. We thank you that we can read of things that are full of joy and hope. Many this day will have nothing better to do than enjoy themselves. Father, we thank you for the privilege of enjoying yourself. This doesn't make us any better than anyone else, but it does, O oh Lord, give us a burden for them. And we ask that in our worship today we may not be so selfish that we forget the world outside, that listening to your voice, we may be taught by your Spirit how to be the better equipped to meet the needs of people around us. We pray that you will set us on fire and that others may feel the glow. We pray that you will refine us so that others may catch a glimpse of a life that is better. We pray that you will fill us with the love of Jesus, that those who are starved of affection and lonely may realize that we have a friend who sticks closer than any brother. We ask again that you will take the written word and make it the living word and then make it the lived world word that we may be read and known of all men. We ask it for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us turn to the word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to our food and drink? Do we not have the right to be accompanied by a wife as the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say this on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it is treading out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of a share in the crop. If we have sown spiritual good among you, is it too much if we reap your material benefits? If others share this rightful claim upon you, do not we still more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offering. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing this to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. 
for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with the commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my preaching I may make the gospel free of charge, not making full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being without the law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Well, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I pummel my body and subdue it, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians is an extraordinary passage. For one thing, Paul talks so much about himself, and that's not really a preacher's job. He said to the Corinthians, when I came to you, I didn't want to talk about anything but Jesus. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ. And here he is talking about himself by the chapter. Why should he do this? And then another surprising thing about this, is that he seems to make out that the ministry of preaching the gospel is a job, just like anybody else's. He seems to reduce the whole thing to a thing for which one should be paid, a job to be done like a butcher and a baker and a candlestick maker, or as he says, like a soldier, a market gardener or a herdsman. And his job of preaching is just the same as their job, of milking goats or planting cabbages. Now, is this the right view of the ministry? Isn't that reducing it all to a kind of profession or a trade? There are many surprising things in this chapter. And perhaps the most surprising is, he says, I'm not going to let anybody stop me boasting. I'm not going to let anybody rob me of my pride. Is it right for a Christian to talk like that? Surely a Christian should be humble and have no boasting and no pride in his own work. Well, is that true? We're going to find some of our precious ideas overturned by this chapter. We're going to have to come to it with open minds and think again about the ministry of Christ. Now what is the connection between chapter 9 and chapter 8? Bearing in mind that Paul didn't write chapter 9 in the middle of a letter. Who writes chapters and verse numbers in a letter? And it's one of the things that has helped to spoil the Bible for us that we demand all these figures in the middle of all the words. God didn't put them there. He wanted us to know our Bible so well we didn't need to have numbers to help to find our way around. And the early Christians for a thousand years had to find their way through this book without any numbers to help them. They had to know it. They couldn't just say John 3.16. Well now, what is the connection? Because it just flows straight on from what we call chapter 8. I can sum it up in one sentence. A Christian is not bound to use his freedom. Now that sounds a bit Irish, all apologies to any with blood from over the Irish channel in their veins. But listen again. A Christian is not bound to use his freedom. That would be a dreadful kind of freedom if you were bound to use it. 
I'm reminded of the communists speaking at Hyde Park Corner and saying, when we're in power, you'll all have a house, you'll all have a car, and you'll all smoke cigars. And a man in the crowd said, but I don't like smoking cigars. When we're in power, you'll smoke cigars and like it, said the communist. You're not bound to use your freedom, says Paul in chapter 8. You're not bound to do things that you have a right to do. Real freedom is to be free not to do the things you are free to do. And that's tremendous freedom. That's put you right in charge of your life. So that you may be free to do a thing, but you're also free to say, I'm not going to do it. In what circumstances would you say that? The answer is, when you love other people. I can shorten the theme of this morning's sermon even more to three words. It's not just saying that a Christian is not bound to use his freedom. Here it is, love limits liberty. And again, if you can just hold one sentence from a sermon, by the way, that's not a wasted sermon. If you go away with one sentence really planted in your mind, it's been worth my preaching. And I would just say those three words, love limits liberty. And voluntarily every Christian foregoes certain rights of liberty that he has for the sake of other people. And Paul is saying, I will now tell you how I've had to do this. I will give you an example in my own life. That's a bold thing to do. But then Paul was bold. And he says in chapter 11 verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In other words, you can learn from my life as well as my lips. So let me tell you about my life. He begins by pointing out his unique position, the highest position in the Christian church. At the level of human beings, there is no higher position in the church than to be one of Christ's apostles. It is they who decide the doctrine of the church. It is they who began the church. It is the apostles' teaching and fellowship, breaking of bread and of prayers that we continue in to this day. To be an apostle was to be right up there, to be over everybody else. And if there is such a thing as a hierarchy in the church, which there isn't, the apostle is the peak of the pyramid. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Now, how do you get to be an apostle? The answer is you've got to have seen Jesus with your eyes. All those who saw Jesus with their eyes after his resurrection and were commissioned by him were apostles. And Paul was like somebody born out of due time, way after all the others. After they'd all seen the Lord and become apostles, he says, I saw him too. And that puts me on a level with them. I am an apostle. I have the apostolic authority. I have rights and powers like all the other apostles. And so he establishes his position away at the top of the ladder. And the proof that he's an apostle, he says, is what happened when I came to speak to you. I preached as an apostle. God blessed it. You are there as a result. So even if others say I'm not an apostle, you can't say it. You know because God honored my apostleship. Now that's the position. Now, he says, that gives me a right to have finance from you. Now this is an apostle talking. He says, I have just as much right as Peter and all the other apostles to come to you and say, I have a right to your money. Now that's an incredible right to be able to go to a church and say, I have a right to money from you, hand over. And he says, I have that right. And he bases it on one very simple principle. Labor deserves a living. And this principle runs right through life, that everybody who works deserves to have material support from those for whom they work. And this applies to every mortal thing that happens in ordinary life. A butcher who supplies meat 
to people has a right to money from his customers to keep himself and his family. A bus driver who brought you here this morning has a right to the wages for himself and his family. A principle that runs right through life. Therefore, says Paul, an apostle who lives to serve the church has a right to a living wage for himself and his family from the church. He's saying what applies to a butcher applies to an apostle. What applies to a bus driver applies to a preacher. We're all in the same world. What we can't do is have people opting out of a basic principle and living as if somehow there's a kind of spiritual separateness about not living for a living and getting a living by your labor. Now he says this happens in every ordinary sphere. Did you ever hear of a soldier going to war without getting paid for it? No, of course you never did. Indeed one of the phrases that's come into our modern language is the phrase mercenary. Mercenary. It means a soldier who gets paid to fight. But then doesn't every soldier? Some of you were in the forces. Did you not get paid for fighting for your country? Of course you did. Or take a market gardener, says Paul. Can you imagine a market gardener who never has a cabbage out of his garden for his own family? Sorry, I've just caught sight of one up in the gallery, so I'll hasten on. What about a man who looks after a herd of goats or cows? Well, I know what happens on a farm. Every one of us who worked milking those cows were entitled to so many pints of milk to take home. And we had it ourselves. It runs right through life. And Paul says, now hold on a moment, somebody's surely going to say, ah, but surely you're in spiritual service. You're talking about ordinary human affairs. Surely this is simply a human practice. And Paul says, ah, no. It is also a divine principle. It's written into the Bible. And the law of Moses says this is more than a human practice. It is a divine principle. And it applies even to animals. Don't tie up the muzzle of an ox when he's threshing out the corn. And if you've ever seen an oxen going round and round threshing out the corn in the Middle East or, or seen a picture of it, you'll know that every so often it drops its head and it takes up a mouthful and it munches as it goes round. It has a right to do that. It's working for those men producing corn, therefore it has a right to feed on the corn itself. Now this is a principle which God applies to animals. And therefore Paul says, do you think he thinks only about the animals? No. He thinks about every person who works in the whole world, whether he works in the kitchen or the pulpit. It's a principle that runs right through. Do you think he was only thinking of oxen? No. He was thinking of us. And when he says us, he means preachers. Now I'm so thankful I can just expound this chapter or it would seem a bit personal. Let me just expound it quite impersonally. Paul says, if I work to give you spiritual food, is it too much to expect that you give me physical food for myself and my family? Is that too much to expect? You expect it in your daily work? I expect it in mine. It's as simple as that. Unless someone still say, ah, oh, well, Paul, you've quoted human practice, you've quoted the Old Testament, but uh, you're an apostle. Paul goes further and he says, don't you know that in the Jewish temple, in every pagan temple, those who conduct the services help themselves to the collection. Those who offer a sacrifice take home a joint of meat for their Sunday dinner. And that applied in the Jewish temple, it applied in every pagan temple. And still somebody may say, ah, but Christ called us to live by faith. So Paul comes right crashing down to Christ and he says, listen to what Christ says, the laborer is worthy of his hire, hire. And that's what Jesus said when he sent his disciples out two by two. Therefore, never be ashamed of using the word hire about Christian service. Bless you, you've hired me as your pastor. That doesn't embarrass or ashamed me at all. Somebody else has hired you as a draftsman, as a postman, as a lorry driver. We are all hired. It is a principle of life. 
Now somebody may say, oh, Mr. Pawson, you're spoiling my conception of Christian service. I have always looked up to those who stopped working for a living and left it all and went away to do wonderful things. Well, I'm sorry if I'm spoiling it. If you feel that way, you are thinking that what I'm doing is bringing down the work of ministry to the level of an ordinary job. I'm not doing that. I'm lifting every ordinary job to the level of the ministry. Can you see that? I'm saying you are hired and so am I. We are all living by faith if we are where God wants us to be. And if God called you to be a butcher and you're hired as a butcher, then you are as much in the ministry and vocation and Christian service as I am hired to preach. Now if you say, well, this somehow produces temptations because it means someone could go into the ministry for the money and it would be an awful abuse if somebody did and if you thought I was in this to make a financial profit, it would be a terrible thing. Is it not just as bad for you to go into a job for the money? If it's wrong for me too, it's wrong for you too. Do you see what God is saying? He's putting all service in the same category. All hiring, all labor, all wages, all income in the same category. To be a butcher for Christ is as noble as to be a preacher for Christ. To be where God wants you to be. Keep using the word butcher because it one of our recent men's contact clubs, Gordon Kingston, spoke about butchering for God, if you'll forgive the phrase. And it was lovely to hear how he had worked out this matter. And he told me afterwards privately in conversation how he'd had to examine his own heart to see whether he was in it for the money, to see whether he was grasping for himself in this job or seeking to serve other people in their needs so that we're not bringing the ministry down to the level of an ordinary job. We're bringing the ordinary job up to the level of the ministry. And the other side to all this teaching, which is equally practical and comes in another letter of Paul's, is this. If a man will not work, neither shall he eat. In other words, the two things God teaches about work are these. Number one, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. Number two, a fair day's work for a fair day's wage. Two utterly practical principles. And wouldn't Britain be in a different economic position if we simply applied those two? Every Christian needs to start there, whether he's a pastor or whatever. Now Paul has laid this down so clearly that I think I need to say no more at this stage. But now he says, nevertheless, I have renounced the right. Now let me say straight away that I personally, David Pawson, have not renounced this right. Neither did Simon Peter, neither did all the other apostles. But Paul did. And I notice a number of things. He was the only apostle who did. Secondly, he didn't imply that the other apostles were inferior. It is always open to someone to live by faith, to renounce this right of support. Let them never think or say or imply that that makes them more spiritual or more Christian or nobler or higher. It is simply that God has called them in a different way. And as God calls one to be a butcher and one to be a pastor, he may call one to be a pastor on a salary and one to be a pastor on what is called faith. Let us see that all the callings of God are equal and the same. But Paul says, I've renounced this right. I'm not even writing now to you Corinthians to get some money from you. I don't want it. Why have I told you all this? And it's interesting that it was someone who renounced the right who told them all about it. I think if he'd kept the right, he wouldn't have mentioned it. But since he'd renounced it, he felt free to talk about it. And he actually supports Simon Peter in supporting a wife. But why did he renounce it? What's the reason? Well, he gives two reasons. And incidentally, he hadn't a family, which meant that he was free also to renounce this right. But here are two reasons. First of all, he says, no obstacle to the gospel. 
And one of the unfortunate features of Greek life was that the public entertainment was not in the hands of pop stars or communication men on the telly, but in the hands of traveling lecturers. And they could get a big crowd and then they would send the hat round. And they got the kind of money a pop star gets today. Kind of money we'll say Cliff Richard gets today. And so when Paul <coughs> went around preaching, he was rightly sensitive at this point. He didn't want them to think that he was in it for the money. And so he said, I've renounced the right to avoid misconception. Now, I think that happened when Dr. Billy Graham came to England. Do you remember when he came to Haringey? The number of people I met who said, how much is he getting out of this? They assumed that with a congregation that size and a collection that size, he must be doing jolly well indeed, judging Billy by themselves and assuming that he was doing exactly what they would have done if they'd been him. They were wrong, of course. Billy Graham never took a halfpenny from England for any of the preaching he did here. Now, he does take a salary. He takes the normal salary of a minister of a church in the United States from the Billy Graham organization. He's on a salary. But he refused to take anything in England. Why? Because he knew people were going to say, you're in it for the money. And so he renounced the right. He had every right to expect us to support him while he was with us. But he renounced it so that no obstacle be placed in the path of the gospel. That was one reason of Paul. The other reason is that renouncing this right gave him pride in his work. And he said, I'd rather die than have you take my pride away. Now, is this right or is it wrong? Let me say this. I believe every Christian should have a pride in his work, whatever his work may be. And how do you get a pride in your work? I'll tell you, by doing a little voluntary extra that's not expected, by going beyond what you've agreed to do for your employer by putting the extra touches that he didn't expect, and then you've got a pride in your work. You've done more than you need have done. And Paul says, I get a real kick out of my work by making the gospel free of charge. I'm going beyond what is needed, beyond what is expected. I have every right to expect money for preaching, but I'm doing it for free because I, ha I want to have a pride in my work. And I'm not let, going to let anybody take that away. He says, preaching is not a voluntary thing. I can't boast about being a preacher. Necessity is laid upon me. God told me to. If I didn't preach, he'd curse me. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. That's why I'm in the ministry. People have asked me, what are you in it for? The answer is, I couldn't stay out of it. I'd be in a terrible state if I was not a minister because God's blessing wouldn't be on my life. He told me to be a minister. I've got to be. And that's, as, that's all it is. It's as simple as that. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. But if you're going to have pride in your work, then you're going to seek to do something more than you've been told to do. If I am simply doing it without my free choice, then I am simply a steward entrusted with a commission. I'm like a person who's been employed. I've got to do it. Now you think of your daily work. Think of the things you've got to do in the office that the boss expects to be done. Now think of something that you needn't do, that he won't expect, but that you could do to make your work that little bit extra. That's the area in which your pride of work will come. Why should not a laborer be proud of his work? It's lovely to stand back and say that's a good job done whether I get any more for it or not. Once again, this is a thing lacking, so lacking in British industry, isn't it? Pride in work, doing the little bit extra, not trying to get the extra tea break, but just staying on to make a good job. We're never going to get out of our economic troubles until we discover again pride in our work. The tragedy is that much industrialization has produced a kind of work that can't allow any pride. A mechanical, routine, mass assembly approach to work that doesn't allow a man to do that little extra and to make a good job. 
No wonder he gets frustrated. No wonder he loses self-respect and thinks that people are against him. But pride of work, Paul says, I'm a worker, I'm a laborer, I have a right to wages, but I want more than this. I want pride in my work. And so I go beyond what I need and I renounce my rights. Now he says, my reward, what is my reward? Well, my reward is to have no reward. And he said, I get a great kick out of that. My reward is to have no reward. It's always a joy to do something for nothing. But he says, there's something more to it than that. I am able to leave people with the right impression that God's grace is free. To me, it is a tragedy that so often the church gives the impression that we're always wanting to get something from someone. I remember going to a door and saying, I'm from so-and-so church, and the man said, yes, what is it for this time? And he put his hand in his pocket like that. I said, I haven't come for anything. I've come to give you something. He was so surprised. It's one of my reservations about Christian aid. Not sure how Christian it is to go begging and asking almost forcing people because you're saying you're calling back for the envelope. This is the impression we've given that we're after something, after something. Come to our bring and buy. Come to our bazaar. Massive jumble say we, we tell them, come on, come on, we'd love to see you, but we'd like to see your purse too. It's lovely to go to the outsider and say, we're not going to take from you, we've come to give. Quite frankly and quite personally, it's one of the reasons I decided very early on never to take any fees for weddings or funerals. I would want somebody to feel that I'm here to serve. I'm here to give. It's a reason why I like us not to go around the doors begging and selling, but giving a book to read, giving them something. Paul says, this is why I'm doing it. My reward is the joy of them simply receiving of being able to serve them free of charge. That's a terrific reward. Well, Paul says it with his life as well as his lips. I'm here to give, not to get. And he's quite frank that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And when I once refused a gift from someone, they said, now come on, you should let me have the blessedness of giving sometime. And I had to bow my head and take it. Now the result of all this was that actually he became more free if you renounce your rights, you become more free. Now, how did that happen with Paul? Paul says quite simply, no one is my boss. Because I do it for free, no one has a claim on me. I'm free. No man has a claim on my life. I'm free. And therefore, he had no boss. Nobody to pay the piper and play the tune. And he was free because he'd renounced his right. Do you know, Jesus taught this. The more you renounce your rights the more free you are. The less claim anybody has on you, the less hold they have on you, the more you renounce your rights. Now this is the opposite of the world's thinking. Claim your rights, protest for your rights, march for your rights, get your rights and you'll be free. The way of Christ is renounce your rights and you'll be really free. No one will have a claim on you when you renounce your rights. But now he says something else. I am self-employed, I am nobody's servant, I will not let anybody hire me. Therefore, I have made everybody my boss. Now let's think that one through. Paul says, I am nobody's servant, therefore, I became everybody's slave. At the beck and call of everybody. Now again, there's a, a big difference here. Most people think of freedom as freedom from others for self. Paul says real freedom is from self for others. Nothing could be a greater contrast than the world's idea of freedom in Christ's. Not freedom from others for, for me, but freedom from me for others. Freedom to become a slave. Freedom to become everybody's slave. You know, in chapter 7, the previous page, he says, if you're a slave and you can buy your freedom, get it. Now he says, I'm a free man, so I'm becoming a slave. Now, how do you become a slave? How did Paul? The answer is, by letting other people decide his manner of living. 
by changing his life according to the company he's in. Now here we're on very thin ice and I've got to say this very, very carefully so that you don't misunderstand me. Real freedom is to be free to be what other people are. Why? In order to win them. Paul says if you're ever going to board a human soul you must get alongside first. If you're really free then you're free to behave as they behave except in sin. Now he then illustrates how he does this. A slave has to fit in with the way of life of others. A slave has got to behave in a house as the people in the house behave. A slave has got to do things that the people in that house do and want him to do. And we are called to be everybody's slave. Do you know it's the most difficult thing in the world for a Christian to do? Paul says, when I'm with the Jews, I observe the Sabbath, I eat kosher meat and I do all that they do because I want to get them for Christ. When I'm with the Gentiles, I ignore the Sabbath, I ignore kosher meat, I'll eat anything. I'll get alongside them. Now let me speak to my own heart and yours. We Christians are jolly bad at social life with people who are not Christians. We much prefer the social life among ourselves where everything's just as we've been brought up and where we can behave as we've always been used to behave. But Paul is saying if you're going to win people you'll have to get out of that rut. You'll have to learn to mix freely and socially in situations where you just don't feel at home, where you don't feel at ease. You've got to learn to be adaptable, to win people for Christ. Now, as I was thinking about this, forgive me for using a personal illustration, but I remember how this came home to me once. I, I think you know that I was a chaplain in the RAF. And I went into that from a typical sheltered minister's life. You know, a minister's life can be terribly sheltered unless he's careful. Just drinking tea with the church ladies all day. At least that's what some people think. But if you're not careful, you can be very sheltered and just meet nice people all the time. And the RAF was certainly not that way. For one thing, it was nearly all men. And uh, they weren't church men either. Now a fortnight ago, sitting in this church, just down in one of those pews was a man and I looked down and I hadn't seen him for years. In fact, I remember vividly two things that happened. When I knew him first, he was a flight sergeant in the RAF. We were brothers in Christ. But here are two little pictures, glimpses of our life together in the RAF. One was a cocktail party in the officer's mess. He was on duty at the door, all polished and spick and span. And there he was standing at the door and I remember him saluting me and I came in as a squadron leader and we saluted each other and I came in with my wife dreading this thing and wishing we could just run a thousand miles. It was to meet the Air Commodore. If any of you have been in any of these situations, you know how dreadful they are. And I went in and there was the flight sergeant and I just saw his eye half closed as we saluted. <laughs> we were two Christians caught up in such an alien situation. But if we were ever going to win those people, we had to be in that situation. I had to learn to adapt and I loathe cocktail parties trying to prime pumps to get them going. It really is a most distasteful social habit to me. But I had to go. And the result was we got alongside some of the officers. And there are men in church today as a result. But I remember also that flight sergeant in my pastor's office there, chaplain's office, drilling me up and down. He was giving me orders then because I was sloppy on the parade ground. I said to him, look, will you come along late one night? We'll draw the curtains in the office. And will you drill me? And he had me about turn and up and down this office shouting at me if anybody had seen this happening. And we had to reverse roles, quite literally. I was now sort of LAC and he was driving me up and down. But why were we doing all this? Why was he saluting me one day and then marching me up and down the next. The answer was we were trying to get alongside people, trying to adapt, trying to be with them so that they could be with us and so that we might win them all. Mind you, funnily enough, the first day I made such a mess 
of the parade, saluting the warrant officer because I couldn't see anything here or here, <laughs> that I think I won more friends among the RAF men <laughs> by being sloppy than I did by being fixed. But what is Paul saying? He says, I'm ready to adjust my behavior. I won't sin for anybody, but I'll go as far towards them as I can without sinning. I'll change my way of life, my way of eating, my social habits, if I can get through to people. Oh, God grant us this adaptability. There had been a day when Paul the Pharisee said, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. That's self-righteousness speaking. I thank thee that I am different. I don't go to these things. I don't mix with people like that. They said of Jesus he was a glutton and a wine-bibber. Paul says, renounce your right to be different. Let go this liberty to be different. Be free to be like other people. And again, you see, it's the opposite of what the world says. The world says, I'm going to be different. The young people say, I'm going to dress differently. Let's be free from convention and the establishment. Let's not conform. And Paul says, real freedom is freedom to conform, to get alongside people and to get to know them and win them for Christ. And he said, why do I do it? To share in the blessings of the gospel. You have a lovely share in the blessing of the gospel when you see somebody one for Christ because you got alongside. It's an incentive. The plowman plows in the hope of sharing in the crop, says Paul. And the preacher preaches in the hope of sharing the blessing of people coming to Christ. I've been taking far too much time on this. Let me move on. He changes the slide again now, a picture from the employment world, the slavery world, to the sport world. The Isthmian Games were second only to the Olympic Games. And he says, let's look at this picture of an athlete who deliberately limits his liberty for the sake of a prize. Now he says, you know that entering a race doesn't get a prize for you. And all the Christians running the Christian race won't get prizes, no. There'll only be prizes for those who run well, those who win the game. It's terribly important, this. You are running the, the race, you're in it. As soon as you became a Christian, you're in the race but you won't necessarily win a prize. Run as though you're going to get a prize. Be determined to obtain it. We're not living in the wonderland of Alice, the Caucasus race where everybody wins and everybody gets a prize. We're not in that kind of race. We're running in a race that's not competitive either, but a race in which there's a prize only for those who make it, only for those who run well. It's not the prize of salvation. That will come to you because you're a Christian. It's the prize of the honor of being recognized by Christ as a good runner. And you know, in the Greek games, they would go in for a year's training before a race. And during that year, the self-discipline was such that they cut out not only bad and harmful practices, but good things. You can't win a race unless you're prepared to cut out good things as well as bad unless you're prepared to watch others guzzling and having their food and saying, I'm not having it. And the discipline of an athlete in training must be continuous and complete. It's no use him saying, well, I'm going to have a week off and I'm going to indulge myself and then I'm going back to training. He will undo all the months of training. It's no good a Christian training himself in discipline then saying, now I'm going to have a week off and indulge myself and then I'm going to come back. He'll undo months of training in one week. It must be continuous and it must be complete. It must be over every area of an athlete's life. It's no use him cutting out smoking and drinking heavily. He's got to cut out all the things that are going to hold him back, even good things. And he's going to have to deny himself things that other people have a right to if he's going to win the race. Paul says, look at it this way now. Limit your liberty as an athlete who's cutting out even good things so that he can get a prize. That's the discipline of the Christian life. It's tough, it's hard, and yet Paul says, I do it. He says, it's no use playing at it. Shadow boxing is no use. Playing at it is no use. He says, literally, your body is a good servant but a bad master. And he says, I punch my body. Literally, his body he had to deal with 
because I'm afraid it is the body's desires so often that causes the old fight between the pillow and prayer and the blanket and the Bible. It's the body that needs to be pummeled. Lest, and here he comes to his one great fear, lest I be disqualified from running. Now he is not saying here, as many people have thought he was saying, lest he lose his salvation. Paul was never afraid of that. But he was afraid of being disqualified from getting the prize. One of my most embarrassing memories is when I was a boy at school. I was then, I think it was nine when this happened, or ten. And there was a, a race in which all the form had to compete at sports day. And it was a long race. It was either 440 or 880, I forget. Went on and on round the field. And the Lord never blessed me as a runner. I'm not a runner. He blessed me with flat feet. And while I can catch a bus as well as anybody on a short sprint for the long hard ground, I'm no good at all. I don't mind admitting. Well, they began to pass me on the second time around and it went on like that. And finally the PE instructor, and incidentally I was one of the smallest in the class, so the PE instructor finally loped out onto the field, tapped me on the shoulder and said, I think it'd be best if you went and sat down and watched the others. <laughs> and in front of all the parents and all the staff, little me had to go and sit down. Oh, it was most humiliating. Do you know Christ can disqualify you from running? He can say, out of the race, boy. He can discard a poor tool. And Paul says, I've invited so many others into the race. It'd be terrible if I was disqualified and told, no, you, you don't have a chance of a prize. Out of the race. Now Paul is saying this. A Christian will never get a prize unless he limits his liberty. Unless he stops thinking of his own rights and for the sake of others denies himself the things that he has every right to have. One of the most challenging missionary books you could ever read and everybody who's not going to be a missionary should read it is called Have We No Right? Have We No Right? And it's written by a missionary saying, have we no right to a home of our own? Have we no right to have the furniture we'd like to choose? Have we no right to have children at a good school? Have we no right to stay in our own country and choose where we live? Have we no right? The answer is no, a Christian has no rights. None at all. Paul says, I'm an apostle. Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? Yet, if you study my motives, there is no self-interest in them. If you study my methods, there is no self-righteousness being different from other people. If you study my morals, there is no self-indulgence. And if I can forego my rights, then so can you at Corinth. Let us pray. <coughs> Father, we're in a world which is so anxious to have its rights, its claims, striking for what it believes it should have, protesting when these claims are not met. Father, it's terribly easy for us living in this world to have the same outlook, to seek our freedom to do what we want. Father, give us that discipline to run the race, to go into training, to take up our cross daily and deny self and follow you. Help us to stretch out for that prize Help us to be willing to limit our liberty for the sake of others, to get alongside them, to be willing to adapt to their way of life so that we may introduce them to him who is the way, the truth, and the life. Lay these words in our hearts, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen.